You know him well, Dr. Janice. Thank you. Okay, so um, I mentioned last week that today you're going to be cosmetic dentist. Cosmetic dentistry is not a specialty, mostly done by general dentists and some prosthodontists. But it's a, a part of your practice that is very gratifying. I'm going to pass this around. And all this is, is I've taken some of the slides from my PowerPoints, printed them up, and laminated them. And I used to keep this in my waiting room. And patients would look at them, and they'd just kind of look through. And I got a lot of referrals that way, because they'd see things in here that they say, oh, I know somebody that has that, and they'd refer them to me. So I'll start it up here and you just pass it around. And it's very easy to put that together. You just take some of your pictures that you've taken of your own work, not a textbook, and not something you found online, but stuff that you've done, and uh, print them up and laminate them, put them in your waiting room. OK, so I'm not talking to you today as if you're dental students. We are going to pretend that you are graduate dentists and you've come here for a continuing education course. I want you to think that way because you've had enough experience now and you've done enough in the lab that you're ready for this. So let's just turn off the dental student thing and your colleagues now. We're all colleagues. So what we're going to, as far as the diastema closure is concerned, I'm not going to even talk about that today. You're going to go in the lab and just do it based on what you found out by reviewing the material. There will be a printout on each desk showing the preparations, because we have to create a diastema, because there isn't one there. And you know how to do that, and then the finish case. And so that's all we're going to do on diastema. This other lecture that we're going into now is not going to be an assignment that you're going to be graded on. You're on your own on this one. <clears throat> you're going to do it on your own time and then show it to one of us at any convenient time and see how you did. Does everybody understand that? The diastema closure you're being graded on, that's today's exercise. But what we're going to talk about now, the composite veneer, is something you're, is extracurricular. But I encourage you all to do it because within six months, you're going to face one in the clinic. So that's the way we're going to do it. So direct composite veneer, we're going to do it on tooth number eight. And then what is a mock-up? Anybody have an idea what a mock-up is? Have we ever talked about that? Yes. Great. That's something you can do on a study cast and practice what you're going to do in the mouth, or you can do it directly in the mouth. And I'm going to show you both, to both techniques today. So what we're going to learn today, this case that I created, we're going to pretend that there's class 5 caries in the tooth, and we're going to take care of that. Then we're going to reduce the whole labial surface about a half a millimeter so that we can affect a, a shade change. So in other words, we're, this, let's imagine that this tooth has caries in it. It's been endodontically treated, and it's discolored. And it's discolored so much that we can't really bleach it. So we're going to cover the whole labial surface with composite. So that's our make-believe case. And then we're going to talk about how to diagnose, restore, finish, and polish a direct composite veneer. Now, there are other kinds of veneers. They're called porcelain veneers. And you'll be introduced to that in your fixed prosthodontics course. <clears throat> there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Porcelain veneers are excellent restorations, but they're more expensive, and you have to remove more tooth structure. Composite veneers are a little bit more conservative, and we can preserve more tooth structure. And you'll see how that works as we go through. So a mock-up procedure can help the dentist and the patient visualize how the aesthetic goals can be achieved. There's nothing like doing something 
on a patient and letting them see it in their mouth than it is from showing them pictures or doing imagery, you know, with uh, Photoshop or something like that. When they see it in their mouth, I, I can honestly tell you, every time I've done this, I've had 100% acceptance, case acceptance. Once I show the patient what I'm going to do, and it doesn't take very long, they, they want it done. And if it, it's not covered by insurance, they'll figure out how to pay for it. So let's just go through some cases. And I just wanted to mention something. Some of you may be interested in going into dental education someday. I actually spent 20 years in my office photographing cases that I thought would be useful in teaching, and that's where most of these come from. So if you're thinking of teaching someday and this kind of stuff, get yourself a good camera and start taking pictures. It takes a little more time, but it's worth the investment. So these are actual cases that I've done. So peg laterals, you've heard about peg laterals, and we see quite a few of them. So what are we gonna do about that? If we do a porcelain veneer or a porcelain crown or a zirconia crown, we have to prepare that tooth, don't we? If we use composite, we don't have to remove any tooth structure. We just add what's missing. So that's something that after this exercise, you've done this, you should be able to do that. Now, you'll notice that the shade is just a little bit darker on the laterals. That's because I took the photograph right after I finished the case, and I didn't wait long enough to let the centrals rehydrate. This is a composite bonded bridge, but it also included some diastema closures. This was done at Roseman when I was teaching there, and the student I worked with the student to cement the bridge, and then I had to leave, and he did the diastema closures on his own. I think he did a pretty nice job. This was, well, let me back up a little minute. I graduated from dental school in 1961. Composite wasn't around at that time. Actually, porcelain veneers weren't around either. They came out in the 80s. But when composite came out, I got really excited about the idea of being able to take a tooth-colored material and add it to a tooth and make it look good. But I didn't really know how to use it, so I started taking CE courses, continuing education courses. I took hundreds of hours of courses all over the United States. I traveled because I was really dedicated to finding out how to use the stuff, because we didn't learn it in dental school. So. After taking a lot of these courses, I came back to my office, and in this case presented, and the patient needed to have some class threes done. Okay, you can see that, pretty obvious. But I thought, well, I'm gonna just charge them for the class three restorations, but I'm gonna take it a step further and apply some of this knowledge that I've been learning. So I, this is what the case looked like when I finished. Of course, I, re I replace and remove the caries, replace the restorations that needed done. But I took it a little step further. So if you look at this view, notice that the lateral is over on the left side is in lingual inversion. So I built it out. So in other words, I took care of the caries, restored the teeth, at the same time applied some of these aesthetic principles that I've been learning. I didn't charge the patient for all that. I just charged as if I were doing the restorations because I, I wanted to have the experience of doing it. And when I showed him, when I got done in that lower left photograph and he looked at it in the mirror, he was shocked and um, because he thought he was just gonna have the fillings replaced. So this just gives you an idea of you know where you can go. Now, you don't have to do the same thing and, and do it for free because people are used to this now. But that was the process I went through. I think you've seen this photo before. These are porcelain, or these are composite veneers. But unfortunately, the dentist or the operator that did it didn't 
must not have done very well in their dental anatomy course in dental school. Maybe they didn't have dental anatomy. They don't have it in all schools now. But that's just not a very nice result. Here's the correction. Now, knowing what you know about dental anatomy and incisal embrasures and gingival embrasures and labial embrasures, that tells the whole story right there. I think you can visualize the difference. So, um, what was it, six months ago that Dr. Vernon taught you the dental anatomy course? That was an important course. This is a composite veneer case that didn't go very well. The patient was not happy with the result. And so we took those off and redid them. Following dental anatomy principles and some other things as well, because if you look at that top photograph, um, you can see some of the composite had broken off because it wasn't bonded properly. Um, Probably the rubber dam was not used, and there wasn't isol you know, good moisture control. So I hope this gives you an idea of that we've got to follow correct principles. So these are my little steps, my 10 steps to get good results. And it should sound very familiar to you, and uh, it, it should reinforce what your thinking already is. It isn't anything new. Okay, we do a mock-up for shade, form, function, and patient acceptance. So we try the composite right on the tooth before, we, before the tooth is dried out. We cure it. There's no bonding agent, no etching. Let the patient look at it and approve the color. So that's shade. Uh, when we do a mock-up, we also can show them what the tooth's going to look like. Second thing is moisture control. I think that we've hammered that home enough. Third thing is correct preparation so you have a clean surface to bond to. And we want to have enamel to bond to as much as possible. And then when we etch, we've got to make sure that we etch the entire surface that we're going to bond to. If you are short somewhere, what's going to happen? It's going to leak and discolor. So you've got to be sure you cover the whole thing. Then we apply the bonding agent, and that's got to cover the whole area. If you're short someplace, you're going to have leakage. We need to use, and you've learned this, you need to use a matrix or Teflon tape so that you can separate the teeth. Patients have to floss between them. And we want to layer the composite. That way we can get a better shade. We can get better marginal adaptation, correct anatomy, and reduction of shrinkage and complete light cure. I hope that all makes sense to you guys. You've had enough experience now. Interproximal finishing, we need to do that with, uh, I didn't put in here using a number 12 blade, but you all know about that now, don't you? You become experts at using that scalpel. And then we have to do our interproximal finishing with graded strips. And it must be able to pass the floss test. We need to have a contact, and it should not fray the floss. Because if it does, the patient's not going to want to floss, are they? We need to correct, create correct occlusion and centric, protrusive, and lateral excursions. So, we can't ignore giving the correct conclusion. And finally, we want to polish it with graded discs and bring it up to a high shine. And you know how to do that. OK, question. Are you a natural born artist? Some of you are. Have, some of you have artistic talent. Some of, it, some of you don't, and it needs to be developed. So I'm going to. I want you to think about this for a minute. Uh, if not, you can train yourself to become a tooth sculptor. Well, I hope so. If I could do it, I think you could do it, because I don't think I'm in, I'm not really that artistic. But I've forced myself to learn how to draw teeth, as you know from dental anatomy, and you've been through the same process. 
So this is something I picked up on the internet that I thought was kind of interesting. This artist, Calvin Nichols, his medium is paper and scissors. And look what he did. So that's done with paper and scissors. It's pretty amazing. Dentistry is an art and a science, so let's become tooth sculptors and use composite as our medium. If you master these previous steps, those 10 steps that I talked about, you'll have happy patients who refer others to you for treatment, which is the best way to build a practice because those patients will come in and they'll have confidence in you even before you start. This was a case when I was in Mongolia, a young man who we did some composite veneers on. We'll take a closer look here. So we worked on six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, and 11. Actually had to shorten the centrals the laterals were lengthened and veneered. Now, when you look at this case on the bottom, do you remember the, the, uh, the drawings that we had in dental anatomy? The shape of the, of the various anterior teeth? When we did this case, we were using those drawings. So it should look familiar to you. The shape of the central, the lateral, and the canine. Now this is a, a three hour appointment. Um, we, there's no lab bill involved. So it's all done right there. So if you're doing porcelain veneers or porcelain crowns, then the, de the lab technician is the one, is the, the artist. If you're doing direct composites, you're the artist. And you gotta develop that talent. Okay, question. Look at those lateral incisors. The patient did not, could not afford or had the desire to have orthodontics done. So what can you do for that patient? So think about it for a minute. So that's done with composite. Now, did we have to do any preparation on those teeth? They're in lingual version. We just built them out with composite. We didn't have to remove anything, did we? We just added to it. This kind of stuff is really fun and patients really appreciate it. And to do orthodontics, we're talking about a few thousand dollars or more. What do you think it costs to have this done? A couple hundred dollars a tooth. You don't have to anesthetize the patient. Uh, you just put on a rubber dam and go to work. So the question was, how much preparation is needed on 7 and 10? Well, we didn't have to do any preparation. We just had to clean up the enamel so we could get a good bond. I don't know if you recognize this photo or not of this person. She was in the news quite a bit a while back because she and her husband paid a lot of money to USC to get their daughters in. And so she was having problems, some legal problems. She wound up doing some jail time. But I, I looked at this photograph, and I couldn't help but to notice tooth number seven. Do you notice tooth number seven? You see, after a while, when you're talking to people or looking at pictures, you're looking at their teeth, <laughs> and, the, and the, the wheels are starting to, to whirl. So if you were um, her dentist, what would you suggest doing to tooth number seven? You could do it with composite, couldn't you? And just a, a simple composite veneer. So that may not have kept her out of legal trouble, but it would have helped her smile. Okay, so this is a patient that came to see me when I was in my practice. Yeah, she was a young woman who was an attorney and she absolutely did not want any tooth structure removed. She was adamant, and that's why um, she had gone to a previous dentist, and he wanted to do porcelain veneers, but you have to prepare the teeth. 
you have to remove about three quarters of a millimeter off the labial and a millimeter and a half off the incisal. They do a portion of veneer. She did not want that, so the dentist did composite veneers and they didn't look very good. <clears throat> so she came to me and I don't have a before picture. I just, I just removed them, you know, I just ground it off. And then I said, well, this is a, a gray teclocycline stain and it's, they're really hard to cover up and portion of veneers are really better but if you don't want any tooth strokes to remove, well, we can try it with composite. So I did a mock-up on tooth number 11, and I, I, it didn't take very long to do it, but I used some opaque, uh, an opaque layer of uh, composite and then just kind of build it up just to see if we could mask that dark gray color. And then I just left it in there, and I said, just leave it in for a couple of weeks, and then you can pop it off and see if you're comfortable with it. So she came back two weeks later, she said, I want the work done. So this is what we did. Now, the case would have come out better with porcelain veneers because the opaquers can be built into the porcelain in the laboratory. But I think we, she was happy with it. And she was very happy with the fact that we did not remove any tooth structure. But this is a little tricky. You've got to use, you've got to put down an opaque layer first to mask out the dark color and then build it up. But it's a possibility. Notice that tooth number uh, six was in the lateral position. Can you see up above? So we had to convert that to a lateral. Dental anatomy, all right? This patient had some tetracycline stain, but it wasn't on the whole tooth. The, the patient was more concerned about the discoloration in the gingival third. So rather than cover the whole tooth, I just did the gingival third and used a, a, an opaque, lighter color. So that was extremely conservative and the patient was very happy with it. Now the only thing is, if you're building up that gingival third, what if you overbuild it? What happens? Then plaque collects under it. If you underbuild it and it's too flat, then you create a problem with the food getting impacted into the sulcus. So you're gonna do something like this. You gotta know your dental anatomy and you've gotta develop your skills so you can get that kind of a result. You gotta be very careful. Question? Um, does, does gingival health in the previous photo look healthier? Uh, sorry, on the previous slide. Um, it looks healthier after the closed with diastomus. Do you, do you feel that the gingiva was inflamed simply because of the diastomus? Okay, now you're talking about another case? The one right before this one. Oh, let's back up then. This one? Yeah, let me like see if I see what you're seeing. They look more inflamed uh, in the first photo, and I was wondering, I mean, I know that diastomus can cause um, some, like, sometimes gingival hyperplasia or some sort of just okay. inflammation. They look healthier after the fact. I guess I was just wondering, like, what... I, I, I get in your point now, yeah. and you're a hygienist, so you notice yeah, these I things. Look at the gun, right okay. Now, like, yeah. <laughs> what, what kind of were you taking? Okay, so to, to answer your question, um, when there's a diastema there or a tooth that isn't formed properly, if you restore it and use correct anatomy and use the correct emergence profile, it will get healthier. And you're going to in that pr presentation on the diastema closures that you guys watched, you'll notice that where there's a big space, you may have a papilla that's kind of growing into that, and it's sort of blunted looking. Well, if we give these the right contour, and they're nice and smooth, and the patient can floss, nature takes care of it and proliferates in there. Yes? When you were saying that those were done by previous dentists, so that's what the result was from the previous composite veneers. And so True. that's an, an example of if you don't follow your anatomy, it's going to cause that. If you do follow it, you get nice healthy tissue. 
It probably would have been a good idea if I took a photograph of the previous work. <laughs> You're right on. So I'm glad that this looks better to you. <laughs> that makes me feel good. OK, so here's a 12-year-old patient. And she's got a fractured lateral, number seven. Number eight, looks like somebody did a composite veneer on it, but they didn't do a very good job of matching the shade. And the form of the tooth is not very good. So is this a case where you would want to be considering doing a porcelain veneer or a crown or something like that on a 12-year-old? No. Because as they get older, that tissue is going to recede. So we just did a composite veneer on uh, number eight. Number seven, the class four. And you know all about class fours. And then I told the patient's mother, I said, these may have to be redone someday because she's young. And when she's older, the tissue may recede. And uh, so this won't necessarily be a permanent restoration. I followed it for 10 years, and we didn't have to redo it. So here again, if you do a good job, if you get the dental anatomy right, and you get the contours right, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. But you've got to develop those skills. OK, this, is the patient, this patient is the orthodontist that I, my office was right next door to his. And he referred lots of patients to me for finish work. And what I mean by that is that after an orthodontist gets done, if there's a peg lateral or a missing tooth or uh, something that's just not quite right, then the case isn't finished until a dentist goes in and fixes it. So he had, in his office, he had a really nice office, and he had these huge pictures on the walls before and after of young people that he'd done orthodontics on. Very impressive, and yet when he smiled, that was his smile. And so he was a little bit self conscious about it. He had some three quarter crowns done on his canines when he was in dental school, and he was con self conscious of the, the gold showing, and just that, you know, he was promoting these beautiful smiles, and yet that was his smile. So I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, I don't want to look like I had a makeover. I don't want to look Hollywood. I want to look better, but I want to do something conservative. So does that kind of get the wheels going in your mind of what you would do? So think about it for a minute. Now look at the lateral incisors. Normally, is the distal surface of the lateral straight like that, or is it more convex? Convex. OK, so let me show you what we did. So I just, with composite, made those laterals look more normal. And by building them out a little bit, it hid the gold. Not completely, but it's a lot less noticeable. So he can still floss in there. On the central incisors, I modified them, but kept the same look. Is that obvious to you? So that when he smiles now, he, he looks better, but he doesn't look like he's had a, a Hollywood makeover. And some patients want that. So that's why I'm, I'm showing you this. Everybody's different. Somebody wants teeth that are just as, you know, as white as this, and they want them to look perfect. And to me, they look a little phony. <laughs> but if that's what the patient wants, that's what you give them. But, um, you need to be able to adapt to what the patient wants. Yes.
with a possible direction because I had to go to the lab and what the lab thought, what the patient thought was my thought and not communicate. So we had to redo all those pictures of those. Got them back and hit them. They were just like checklists. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so none of uh, none of you here are going to make that same mistake. Thanks to Dr. Werner. He clued you in. Okay. Okay, so when I was teaching at UOP, um, I was there five days a week, and I was teaching a couple days in the residency program in the clinic. I was teaching preclinical courses, and I got kind of a reputation for this kind of stuff. So this patient had had a composite periodontal splint done and was not very happy with the result and threatened to, school, to sue the school. So when these things kind of happened, I got involved. <laughs> my, <clears throat> the dean would call me to bail him out. So I, I talked to the patient. I looked at it, and I said, well, I think we can do a little bit better than that, and we won't charge you for it. So we took all the composite off and just handcrafted each tooth uh, with composite. Now, I, I want to explain to you that when you take photographs of your work and you blow it up in a big screen like this, you're going to see some things that you didn't notice when you finished the case. Now, I didn't do this. One of the residents did with my guidance. But in retrospect, on tooth number seven and eight, we could have used a little bit more opaque on the bottom layer to mask out that dark color. Can you see it? But the patient was very, very happy and withdrew the lawsuit, so it was a happy ending. But when I, and, and, and the case really looked good, you know, when the patient smiled, but you can see the discoloration there. So we could have done just a little bit better. But you know, it's a great idea to take photographs of these cases you do because you're going to see things that you could do better. Uh, do you know Emma McCollum? I think she's in the, she's a D2 right now. She uh, sent me a picture of a veneer that she did the other day in the clinic. And by the way, I'm inviting you, when you do this kind of stuff, take pictures and email them to your instructors and let us see what you're doing. So she felt like when she got done with the veneer that it looked really good, and then she took some pictures of them and blew them up, and sure enough, she started seeing things that she wished she had done a little bit better. So it's part of the learning process. The patient may not know the difference, but you will, and then you'll do better. So when I was teaching at UOP, uh, AIDS was a big problem. This was back in the early 90s, and this, and the patients that were HIV positive got their dental work done free there because of the Ryan White Foundation that paid for it. This particular patient, he was in his 30s, and his, he had a very low T cell count, which means that he wasn't going to live much longer. Nowadays, they have much better medications and regimes to help these patients. but. It, he knew that he had a death sentence, but he couldn't smile because he was so embarrassed about his teeth, and the, the grant that we had would not pay for fixed bridge work, which is what he needed. He needed fixed prosthodontics. So I said, if we do this with composite, it'll get paid for. And he said, let's go for it. So here's what we did. So there's the before. There's the after. So if you look carefully at this photograph on the lower right here, notice the ortho wire on the lingual surface. That's braided wire, which is really stiff. And I double, we double abutted on the centrals and then made a pontic, a fixed bridge, all out of composite. And the way you do that is you just take some Teflon tape and lay it over the ridge, over the tissue, and then put your composite right up to it. So it's not an ideal result, but it was about a four-hour appointment, and he was very, very happy with it. 
and I'm very appreciative of it. And then he died two weeks later. So the, that AIDS epidemic was a really sad thing. I, I think that these patients now, uh, they've got medications to really help them a lot. Okay, let's talk about diagnostic composite mock-up on a study cast. So let's say, for instance, six months from now you're in the clinic and you've got a patient that needs some composite veneers. And you're going to do a little instant orthodontic work. So take an impression and get a study model like this. And then come to one of us. Uh, if it's in the evening, I'll be in the lab. Or you can come you know, during the day to any of the instructors here and, and say, OK, this is what I've got. I want to do a mock-up. And it's going to be a direct composite, so I'm going to use composite on it. You can do it with wax. So here's the mock-up. So in other words, the 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, I don't think we did anything on 11. Can you see the changes? OK, so you're doing this in the lab. You've got plenty of time. There's not no. I, I would do this in the mouth with composite. I just wouldn't etch or use bonding agent. I put it on, took me about maybe 15 minutes, let the patient look at it, and they'd say, oh, that looks better. And then I'd start popping them off. And in the meantime, they forgot what their teeth looked like before. And after I got them popped off, they'd say, OK, let's make the appointment to have the work done. But here at school, you're not going to have time to do that in the clinic. So do it on a study model. And then you know how to take a putty index. You take a putty index of that. And then you put bisacryl in it and go to the patient's mouth and stick it in there. And when the bisacryl is all set, pull the impression off. And there's your mock-up. And the patient can look at it. But then you can pop it off. Any question about that? So in this case, it took a putty index. Then the mock-up can be made in the patient's mouth of Visicryl. And you all know about Visicryl now, right? You've been making those temporaries. So if you're going to do it directly in the patient's mouth, this is just a, a quick case to show you how you do it. So I'm just applying some composite on the laterals using my finger, my glove finger that's wetted with patient saliva, smooth it out detail around it just a little bit and cure it 10 seconds. Then we're going to do the laterals both at the same time, or I'm sorry, the centrals, and just lay some composite over it, smooth it out with your finger, detail the embrasures, and cure it. So after five minutes, the patient forgets what their teeth looked like before, and then you start popping it off. And they come right off because they're not etched, they're not bonded. And so we went from the mock-up back to this. And this is why I'm saying that I have never had a patient not make the appointment to have the work done, because they've seen it in their mouth. And I, it, it, it works. So I strongly recommend it. This is another mock-up. What kinds of things do you think you'd want to do on that patient? Obviously, there's a diastema. There, uh, the laterals are a little short. The canines are a little long. So look at the mock-up. That took about 10 minutes to do. And then I took a, a, a uh, you know, a, a mark, you know, a black marker and just made the teeth look shorter so they could visualize, because I figured I could remove that much tooth structure. So with this in mind, with the before picture and the mock-up, can you imagine what the finished case is going to look like? I'll show it to you in a minute. And I always tell the patient when we do the mock-up, yes, this looks better, but we only took 10 minutes to do it. We're going to spend three hours working on your teeth, so we expect the result to even be a little better. So let's see if that was the case.
So can you look from there to there to there? Can, does that make a picture for you? Make sense? So you can be confident that when you're going to spend three hours on that and pay attention to detail, that the result's going to be better than the mock-up. But the mock-up's good enough to sell them on the treatment. Now, <clears throat> when I was teaching at Roseman, we actually took a whole uh, time to do this exercise, but I think you can do it on your own. Take number um, number 11 or number 10, take it out, and replace it with tooth number 25. Everybody with me on that? And create a peg lateral by putting that tooth up there. And looking at it from the incisal view, you can see it needs to be built out labially. It needs to be built out distally. So this is an, a nice way to create a peg lateral. And you can do this on your own. So here's the technique. The first thing you do is air dry it, because if there's saliva on the tooth and you put composite on it, it slides off. So just dry the tooth off. No etching. None of that. So, and I made videos of these. So just dry the tooth off and try to pick out the shade that you think is going to be appropriate. Now I'm doing this in, in two increments because I'm using two different shades. I'm using an A2 on the gingival two-thirds, and then we're going to use a more translucent shade up on the incisal. And you don't really have to do that. I got a little fancy here. But use your finger to shape it and smooth it, and then take a half Hollenbeck or some kind of a composite instrument and just detail the edges. So that's what we're doing here. But we're not going to take a lot of time because this is a mock-up. This isn't a finished restoration. And I'm probably taking more time than I should on this because I knew it was being videotaped. And what you're seeing me do here, you have done, haven't you? I mean, when you're doing class fours. And then I'm looking at it from the incisal view to make sure that it's built out far enough. And then we just cure that for 10 seconds. Oh, this is a spoon excavator. And you use the back end of it to put your put your mammalons, your grooves in for the mammalons. You can use a ball burnisher to do this, but it's kind of big and clunky. And this is a light instrument, so you all know what a spoon excavator is now. Just use the back side of it, because it's a light weight instrument. Okay. Now we're going to, and then that was cured, and then we apply the enamel or translucent material on the incisal. And use your glove finger to smooth it out, shape it. It's very fast that way. And then just go back and detail it with the uh, half home bit. So here it's completed. Labial view. You need to look at it from the incisal, make sure it's built out, because you can't really tell by looking at it from the labial. And then, instead of polishing it, just have the patient lick it with their tongue, with their saliva, and it makes it look like it's shiny, and you don't have to waste time doing that. So I've encouraged some of my students to, when they come across something, they do a mock-up, they take some pictures with their iPhone, uh, this is one uh, that a student took. 
a D4 student, took a before and after with the mock-up. And then um, everybody I've talked to said that the patient made the appointment to have it done, so I guess it works. Okay, now with what we've talked about, I'd like you to look at this patient and start letting your mind work. What would you want to do on this case? This is an 80-year-old patient, uh, very healthy gingiva, but the teeth have just got a lot of mileage on them. So you're, say, for instance, that you're going to do a mock-up on this. Can you kind of visualize where you'd put the composite? So here's the mock-up down below. It's not ideal, but it gives you the opportunity to see what you can do, and it gives the patient the opportunity to see what you can do. So let's look at the finished case. So this, these, oh, those other photographs were retracted smiles where you held the lip up. This is the natural smile. And these are the composite veneers. So in a case like this, you could do porcelain veneers, but you're going to remove 3 quarters of a millimeter of enamel off the labial and 1 and a half millimeter off the incisal edge. Nothing was removed. This is just composite added. Here's a close up. And here's the natural smile. Now, this patient's, uh, because of age and staining and so on, was about an A4 on the shade guide. So the veneers were done with an A2 two shades lighter, and then bleaching was done on the rest of the teeth to implant. So I hope this kind of gets the wheels turning in your mind and some of the things that are possibilities. And I couldn't resist the temptation to put this picture up. <laughs> this is what we don't want our veneers to look like. That's the one that you were talking about. <laughs> That's what she wanted. <laughs> and you didn't give it to her, so you had to redo it. Okay, so here's a little bit of an unusual case. That, can we correct that with veneers? No, there's going to be a few other things involved. So you're beginning to learn this now, that sometimes we need to get periol and we need to get orthodontics and... And that's what the case was here. So three years later, after the patient has had periodontal surgery and orthodontic treatment, this is what she looked like. Okay. So her mouth is nice and healthy now, isn't it? And the teeth are not all jumbled up. However, she's still not happy with her smile, and she spent a lot of money and a lot of time and she's not really happy with it. So she asked me, what's the next step? <clears throat> I said, well, we can do porcelain veneers. We can do composite veneers. We can do all ceramic crowns. And here's what the fee is for each thing. Well, when I presented the fees to her and explained to her that I had to remove, put, basically put her two teeth in this pencil sharpener, to do crowns, she kind of liked the idea of doing composite veneers because they were less expensive and I wasn't going to remove any tooth structure except where there was some decay where those restorations were. <clears throat> so here she is. I did direct composite veneers in one appointment and then I took a, a, a photograph six years later Now, when I show this photograph, like to Dr. O'Connell, have you had Dr. O'Connell yet? Okay, so you know, he's paragons. He didn't pay any attention to the teeth. He was looking at the gingiva, because <laughs> that's, you know, his focus. And he looked at the upper picture of that blunted papilla and how by getting the correct anatomy, 
that papill proliferated down and looks nice and normal now. That's really what turned him on. So, but you're turned on by the teeth too, I hope. <laughs> So this is kind of my favorite case because it was so conservative. We didn't do anything we didn't have to do. We kept the expense to a minimum. And here she is six years later, and you can see we've got nice healthy tissue and we've got good aesthetics. Now some people ask the question and they say, composite veneers don't last very long though, do they? Well, that depends on, on the operator. Because if you do a really good job and do a nice job finishing and shape everything, they can last a long time. But porcelain veneers are even better. The porcelain veneers are great. And you're going to get that lecture from Dr. Uh, Taylor. So that kind of tells the story, doesn't it? So guess who that is? A little younger version of me. But here's my point. If you're going to surf, or if you're going to be a dentist, start out with small waves and learn the basics. That's what you're doing right now. When you get into the clinic, you're still going to be doing the basics, but you're going to be beginning to branch out a little bit. Once you're out of dental school, and you start getting more experience and you start taking CE courses, then you will be to the point where you can go for the big ones. But don't take off on a 20-foot wave until you're ready <laughs> or you're gonna get hurt. And it's, it's the same way with dentistry. You, you, can, get, you can get hurt. <laughs> Okay, so in Utah, the only kind of surf we have in Utah is behind a wake on a boat. This is my son, Damon. Um, this is one of my students from Roseman who was from Texas, and he supplied me with this picture. That's a pretty cool wave he's on. I had another student who was from India, and she came to Utah and was a dental student and was rock, did rock climbing. And this is where I did most of my surfing. It was in Malibu, California. And this is not me, because when I was surfing, they didn't have drones. And this was taken from a drone. But the, it, shows, it shows the formation of the waves. So at Malibu, it was a right slide. It broke over on one side, and you could stay ahead of it. It didn't break in front of you. And, uh, and that's where I spent a lot of time. In fact, I barely got into dental school because I was surfing all the time. Now, I stopped the video right there. Those guys actually shot through the pier. I never did because when I was learning to surf there, uh, there had been a, a, a day that was really big waves, and some guys were shooting the pier, and one of them didn't make it. They never found him. And so I was a little hesitant to try it. <laughs> So, but this uh, is black and white. So this was me back when I was a dental student at UCLA. And uh, my, girlfriend, my girlfriend took that picture, so I just happened to have it. But the point is that if the surf was up and I had an exam at school, guess where I was? So my grades weren't very good. I barely got into dental school. I mean, barely. But once I got in dental school, I did okay. Okay, so question. How can these individuals do these high-risk activities? Well, here's my theory. They can because they think they can. So how does that philosophy apply to what you're doing right now? Well, it turns out it's an absolute necessity. You're surviving because you think you can. So keep going. Okay. Now, this is, I took more time than I was planning to. Um, what I think I'm going to do, because I want you to get in the lab 
in about 10 minutes. Um, this uh, presentation is on YouTube. It doesn't have the audio, although it's being recorded right now, so it will be available. But it probably took me another 30 minutes to go through this whole technique. So I'm going to ask you to, on your own to review the technique, because what we do is we do the class five, and these are all videos. We do reduction, about a half millimeter reduction on the labial surface. And I'm just not gonna take the time to do it right now. <clears throat> But I think you can get it from the presentation on YouTube. Thanks to Dr. Thorell. He's the one that put those on for me. So I'm going very quickly here. But all these techniques are going to look very familiar to you. Teflon tape. You've seen the class five. I've showed that to you before. Then you do the incisal edge with translucent. And then once that's all done, I will show you this video. When you're ready to do the rest of it, so I'm using three different shades here. I use an A3 on the gingival area a translucent shade on the enamel, and then this is A2 for the body. Notice that I'm spreading it out equally so we don't fold it over and make bubbles. And once it's all spread out, use the instrument, that your composite instrument you were born with, and just put a glove over it, smooth it out, contour it, See how it's blending with the incisal increment? Then take your half Holland back or a composite instrument and begin to detail. Now watch this. I hope that looks familiar because you've done a class four. Now, I made this video 30 years ago, and I think it's, you know, things haven't changed that much. See how I'm tucking that in and then forming the labial embrasure? I'm putting some grooves in it so it looks like it has mammalons and that breaks up the light, makes it look more natural. So a combination of your finger and your instrument, you can make it look like a tooth and then cure it. So now it's ready for finishing and you know how to finish. Scalpel, finishing strips, floss. This is the Packer diamond. You all know how to use that now. Smooth it out and then go to your jiffies or your discs. Look at it from different angles to see if it's compatible with the adjacent teeth. Look at it <clears throat> from the incisal to see if the embrasures and the line angles are in the right place. And then here's our finished restoration. Okay, so I could take another 30 minutes and go through in more detail, but I think that you guys can do it on your own. So what we're going to do now, um, there will be one of these sheets on each of your desks and one of these. This is our assignment for today, and um, we'll see what you can do. And then um, for the veneer, you're on your own. Thank you. Just one second.